chapter basically was Kostoglatov, some re-brought up memories on that and how he met the head nurse. And yeah, we'll just go from there. He's in a cancer ward, and this book's about his immediate life post-gulag. I don't think anybody he's in the ward with knows that he's in a gulag or came from the gulag, but uh, that's, yeah. So here we go. Chapter 6, The Story of an Analysis. First, Ludmila Afanseyevna took Kostoglatov into the treatment room. A female patient had just emerged after her session. The huge 180,000-volt X-ray tube hanging by wires from the ceiling had been in operation almost non-stop since 8 a.m. There was no ventilation, and the air was full of sweetish, slightly repellent X-ray warmth. This warmth, although there was more to it than just warmth, made itself felt in the lungs and became repellent to the patients after half a dozen or so sessions. But Ludmila Afansievna had grown used to it and never even noticed whether it was pleasant or not. She had started work there 20 years ago and when the machine had no shield of any sort. She had also been caught under a high-tension wire and very nearly killed. Every day she breathed in the air of the X-ray rooms, and she sat in on screening sessions for far longer than was allowed. In spite of all the modern shields and gloves, she had certainly taken in many more raids, rads or raids, than even the most acquiescent and seriously ill patients, except that nobody bothered to count the raids or to add them up. I'm going to ask the audience really quick. Is it is it rads or raids? Because I know there's a few medical professionals on Periscope. I'm assuming it's raids, because radiation... Maybe it's rads. It sounds cooler to say rads, so I think I might just say rads until someone corrects me. In spite of all the modern shields and gloves, she had certainly taken in many more rads than even the most acquiescent and seriously ill patients, except that nobody bothered to count the rads or to add them up. She was in a hurry, not only because she wanted to get out quickly, but also because the X-ray program could not be delayed, even for a few minutes. She motioned Kostoglatov to lie on the hard couch under the X-ray tube and to uncover his stomach. Then she went over his skin with some sort of cool, tickly brush. She outlined something and seemed to be painting figures on it. After this, she told the nurse about the quadrant scheme and how she was to apply the tube to each quadrant. She then ordered the patient to turn over onto his stomach and she brushed some more lines on his back. Come on and see me after the session, she said. When she had left the room, the nurse told Kostoglatov to turn over onto his back again and laid sheets around the first quadrant. Then she brought up heavy mats of rubber impregnated with lead, which she used to cover all the surrounding areas, which were not, for the moment, to receive the direct force of the x-rays. The pressure of the pliable mats molded to his body was pleasantly heavy. Then the nurse, too, went out and shut the door. Now she could see him only through a little window in the thick wall. A quiet humming began. The auxiliary lamps lit up. The main tube started to glow. Through the square of skin that had been left clear on his stomach, through the layers of flesh and organs whose names their owner himself did not know, through the mass of the toad-like tumor, through the stomach and entrails, through the blood that flowed, along his arteries and veins, through the limp and cells, through the spine and lesser bones, and again through more layers of flesh, vessels and skin on his back, then through the hard wooden board of the couch, through the four centimeter thick floorboards, 
through the props, through the filling beneath the boards, down, down until they disappeared into the very stone foundations of the building or into the earth, poured the harsh x-rays, the trembling vectors of electric and magnetic fields, unimaginable to human minds, or else the more comprehensible quanta that the shell out of the guns pounded and riddled everything in their path. In this barbarous bombardment of heavy quanta, soundless and unnoticed by the assaulted tissues, had after twelve sessions given Kostoglatov back his desire and taste for life, his appetite, even his good spirits. After the second and third bombardments, he was free of the pain that had made his existence intolerable and eager to understand how these penetrating little shells could bomb a tumor without touching the rest of his body. Kostoglatov could not give himself unreservedly to the treatment until he had grasped for himself the theory behind it and so was able to believe in it. He had tried to discover the theory of X-ray therapy from Vera Kornilevna, that sweet woman who had utterly disarmed his prejudice and caution after their first meeting by the stairs when he had been determined that, though the fire brigade and the militia might drag him away, he would never leave this place of his own free will. Don't be afraid, just explain, he used to reassure her. I'm like an intelligent soldier who has to understand his mission before he'll fight. How is it that x-rays can destroy a tumor without touching the other tissues? Vera Kornilyevna's feelings always showed first on her lips, not in her eyes. She had such responsive, delicate lips, like little wings. It was on them that her hesitation was now expressed. They fluttered with doubt. What could she tell him about the blind artillery which cuts down its own men with the same pleasure as it does the enemy's? Well, I'm not supposed to... Oh, all right, of course, the x-ray smashes everything it meets. Only normal tissues recover quickly. Tumor tissues don't. Maybe what she said was the truth. Maybe it wasn't. Anyway, Kostoglatov was glad to hear it. Oh, well, in that case, I'll join in the game. Thank you. Now I know. I'll get better. And in fact, he was getting better. He lay down eagerly under the x-ray, and during each session tried to will the tumor cells to believe they were breaking up, that they were kaput. At other times, he would lie under the tube, thinking about whatever entered his head. Or he might even doze off. Just at that moment, his eyes, having taken in the mass of hanging pipes and wires, he wanted to know why there were so many of them. And if there was a cooling system there, was it water or oil-based? But his thoughts did not stay long on this subject. He could not provide himself with any explanation. As it happened, he began thinking about Vera Gangart. Such a sweet woman would never have been seen in Ushterek. And women like that were always married. However, putting the husband, as it were, in parentheses, he was thinking of her without him. He was thinking how nice it would be to talk to her, not just for a moment, but for a long, long time, to walk with her in the hospital courtyard, for instance. Sometimes he would shock her by the harshness of his judgments. She looked so funny when she was confused. Every time she smiled, her goodness shone like a little sun, even when you met her by chance in the corridor, or as she came into the ward. She wasn't professionally kind. She was just naturally kind. Her smile was kind. Not so much her smile as the lips themselves. They were vital, separate lips, which seemed about to flutter from her face like a lark into the sky. They were made, as all lips are, for kissing. Yet they had other, more important work to do to sing of brightness and beauty. The tube hummed faintly and musically. He was thinking about Vera Gangart, but he was also thinking about Zoya. The strongest memory he had of last night, it had kept on cropping up all morning, 
was of her neatly supported breasts, which formed, as it were, a little shelf, almost horizontal. Well, they gossiped yesterday, a large, heavy ruler for drawing lines and registers lay on the table beside them. The ruler was made not of plywood, but out of a planed block. All evening, Kostoglatov had had temptation to pick it up and lay it on the shelf of her breasts, to test whether it would slide off or not. He rather thought it wouldn't. He also remembered with gratitude the particularly heavy lead-impregnated mat which they had laid on his body just below his stomach. That mat pressed against him and reassured him cheerfully, "'I'll protect you. Don't be afraid.' But maybe it wouldn't. Maybe it wasn't thick enough. Or perhaps they hadn't positioned it accurately. During these last twelve days, Kostoglatov had returned not simply to life, to food, movement, and cheerful disposition, but also to the loveliest feeling in life, which, in his agony of the last few months, he had completely lost. It proved that the lead mat was holding the defense. Nonetheless, he had to get out of the clinic while he was still all right. He didn't even notice that the humming had stopped and the pink wires had begun to grow cold. The nurse came in and began to take off the shields and the sheets. He swung his feet off the couch and then got a good view of the violet squares and figures drawn on his stomach. How can I wash with all of this? He asked the nurse. Only with the doctor's permission. A fine state of affairs. What's the idea? Is it meant to last for a month? He went to see Donsova. She was sitting in the short-focus apparatus room. Through her square glasses, rounded at the four corners, she was examining some large X-ray films against the light. Both machines were switched off, both windows were open, and there was no one else in the room. Sit down, said Donsova dryly. He sat down. She went on comparing the x-rays. Although Kostoglatov argued with her, he did it only as a defense against the excesses of medicine as laid out in a mass of instructions. As for Ludmila Afansievna herself, she inspired only confidence, not just by her masculine decisiveness, by the precise orders she gave as she watched the screen in the darkness, by her age and her indisputable dedication to work and work alone, but also, above all, by the confident way in which, right from the very first day, she had felt for the outline of his tumor and traced it in circumference, so precisely. The tumor itself proclaimed the accuracy of her touch, for it had felt something too. Only a patient can judge whether the doctor understands a tumor correctly with his fingers. Donsova had felt out his tumor so well that she didn't even need an X-ray photograph. She laid aside the X-ray photographs, took off her glasses, and said, Kostoglatov, there is too big a gap in your case history. We must be absolutely certain of the nature of your primary tumor. When Donsova started talking like a doctor, she always spoke much more quickly. In one breath, she would leap through long sentences in difficult terms. What you tell us, of your operation and the year before last and the position of the present secondaries is in agreement with our diagnosis. However, there are other possibilities which we can't exclude, and this complicates your treatment for us. You'll understand it's impossible now to take a sample of your secondary... Thank God. I wouldn't have let you take one. I still don't understand why we can't get a hold of the slides with the sections of your primary... Are you absolutely sure there was a histological analysis? Yes, I'm sure. In that case, why were you not told the result? She rattled on in the rapid style of a busy person. Some of her words slipped by and had to be guessed at. Kostoglatov, however, had got out of the habit of hurrying. The results? There were such stormy goings-on where we were, Ludmila Afansievna, such an extraordinary situation that I give you my word of honor. I'd have been ashamed to ask about a little thing like my biopsy. Heads were rolling. 
and I didn't even understand what a biopsy was for. Kostolotov liked to use medical terms when he was talking to doctors. Of course you didn't understand, but those doctors must have understood. These things can be played about with. Doctors. He glanced at her, at her gray hair which she did not conceal or dye, and took in the concentrated, business-like expression of her face with its somewhat prominent cheekbones. Wasn't that typical of life? Here, sitting in front of him, was his compatriot, his contemporary and well-wisher. They were talking in their own language, common to both of them. And still, he couldn't explain the simplest thing to her. It seemed one had to start too far back, or else end the explanation too soon. Ludmila Afansievna, those doctors couldn't do a thing. The first surgeon was a Ukrainian. He decided I was to have an operation and got me ready for it. And then he was taken on a prisoner's transport the night before the operation. So? So nothing. They took him away. I'm sorry, but he must have had warning. He could have... Kostoglatov burst out laughing. He thought it was very amusing. Nobody ever warns you about a transport, Ludmila Afansievna. That's the whole point. They like to pull you out unexpectedly. Donsova's broad forehead creased into a frown. Kostoglatov must be talking nonsense. But if he had a patient due for an operation... Ha! Listen to me. They brought in a Lithuanian who'd done an even better job of it than me. He'd swallowed an aluminum spoon, a tablespoon. However could he have managed that? He did it on purpose. He wanted to get out of solitary. How was he to know they were taking the surgeon away? So what happened next? Wasn't your tumor growing very fast? That's right. From morning to evening, it was really getting down to it. Then, about five days later, they brought another surgeon from another compound. He was a German. Karl Fyodorovich. So, he got settled into his new job, and after a day or so, he operated on me. But words like malignant tumor and secondaries, no one told me anything about them. I'd never even heard of them. But he sent away a biopsy? I didn't know then. I didn't know about biopsies or anything. I just lay there after the operation. There were little sacks of sand on top of me. By the end of the week, I'd begun learning to move my feet from the bed to the floor to stand up. Suddenly they went round the camp to collect another transport, about 700 men, troublemakers, they said, and Karl Fyodorovich, the gentlest man alive, happened to be in that transport. They took him straight from the hut. They wouldn't even let him do a last round of his patients. Absurd! Wait till you hear about some real absurdity. Kostoglatov was becoming more than usually animated. A friend of mine came running in and whispered that I was on the list for the transport too. The woman in charge of the infirmary Madame Dobinskaya had given her agreement, knowing I couldn't walk, and that they haven't even taken out my stitches. What a bitch. I'm sorry. Well, I made a firm decision. To travel in a cattle truck with unremoved stitches would mean infection and certain death. So I thought, when they come for me, I'll tell them, shoot me here on the bed. I'm not going anywhere. I'll tell them straight out. But they didn't come for me, and... It wasn't because of any kindness on the part of Madame Dobinskaya. She was quite surprised I hadn't been sent. No, they'd checked up in the registration section and found I had less than a year left to serve. But I've got off the point. Anyway, I went over to the window and looked out. Behind the hospital woodpile, there was a parade ground, 20 meters away, where they were hurting everyone with their things ready for the transport. Karl Fyodorovich saw me in the window and shouted, Kostoglatov, open the window! The guards yelled at him, Shut up, you bastard! But he shouted, Kostoglatov, remember this, it's very important! I sent the section of your tumor to Omsk for histological analysis. 
to the Department of the Pathological Anatomy, remember? Well, they herded them away. Those were my doctors, your predecessors. Are they to blame? Kostogletov threw himself back in his chair. He had got himself very worked up, caught up by the atmosphere of that other hospital, separating the essential from the superfluous in patient stories. There is always plenty of the superfluous. Donsova came back to the point that interested her. Well, what was the answer from Omsk? Was there one? Did they tell you anything? Kostoglatov shrugged his angular shoulders. Nobody told me a thing. And I didn't understand why Karl Fyodorovich shouted what he did. But then last autumn, in exile, when the disease had really got a hold of me, an old gynecologist fellow, a friend of mine, began to insist that I make inquiries. So I wrote to my camp. No answer. Then I wrote a complaint to the camp administration. About two months later, I got an answer. After careful investigation of your personal file, there appears to be no possibility of tracing your analysis. I was already so ill with this tumor that I was ready to abandon the whole correspondence, but since the commandantura weren't letting me out for treatment in any case, I thought I'd take a chance and write to Omsk. I wrote to the Department of Pathological Anatomy, and I got an answer in a few days. It was already January. That was before they let me come here. Well, come on then. Wh where is it? Where's the answer? Ludmila Afansievna, when I came here, I couldn't have cared less about anything. It was a slip of paper without a letterhead, without a stamp, simply a letter from a laboratory worker in the department. She was kind enough to write that on the exact date I mentioned, and from the very settlement where I was, a specimen had come in, and analysis had been carried out, and had confirmed, that's right, the type of tumor you've suspected all along, and that an answer had then been sent to the hospital which had made the inquiry, that is, to our camp hospital. What happened next was just typical. I genuinely believe that the answer came, but nobody wanted to know about it. And, Madame Dobinskaya, no. Donsova just could not understand this sort of logic. Her arms were crossed, and she was impatiently slapping her cupped hands against the upper part of each arm above the elbow. But that answer must have meant you needed X-ray therapy immediately. What? Kostoglatov narrowed his eyes jokingly and looked at her. X-ray therapy. There you are. A quarter of an hour, he'd been talking to her, and what had he got across? She still didn't understand a thing. Ludmila Afansievna, he pleaded with her. You see, to understand what things are like over there, well, very few people have any idea. What X-ray therapy? I was still feeling pain where they had operated, as Amajan is now. For instance, I was already back on general duties, pouring concrete, and it just didn't occur to me that I have the right to be dissatisfied. Have you any idea how heavy a deep container of liquid concrete is when two people have to lift it? She lowered her head. It was as if it was she who had sent him out to carry the concrete. Yes, it might be a bit complicated to clear up the details of this case history. All right, then. But what about this answer from the Department of Pathological Anatomy? Why did it have no stamp? Why was it a private letter? I was grateful enough to get a private letter. Kostolgotov was still trying to convince her. That laboratory assistant just happened to be a kind woman. After all, there are more kind women than men. At least, that's my impression. Why was it a private letter? Because of our mania for secrecy. She wrote later on, the tumor specimen was sent to us anonymously, with no indication of the patient's name. Therefore, we cannot give you an official certificate, and we can't let you have slides of the specimen either. Kostoglatov was getting annoyed. Annoyance expressed itself in his face more quickly than any other emotion. What a state secret! Idiots! They're scared that in some department they'll find out 
that in some camp there's a prisoner languishing called Kostogotov, the king of France's twin brother. So the anonymous letter will go on lying there, and you'll have to rack your brains about how to treat me. But they've kept their secret. Don Silva's look was firm and clear. She stuck to her point. I still ought to put the letter in your case history. All right, when I go back to my AUL, I'll send it to you. No, I need it sooner than that. Can't your gynecologist friend find it and send it? Yes, I suppose he can, but I want to know when I can go back there. Kostogotov looked at her somberly. You will go home, Donsova weighed her words, one by one with great emphasis, when I consider it necessary to interrupt your treatment, and then you will only go temporarily. Kostogotov had been waiting for this moment in the conversation. He couldn't let it go by without a fight. Ludmila Afansievna, can't we get away from this tone of voice? You seem like a grown-up talking to a child. Why not talk as an adult to an adult? Seriously, when you were on your rounds this morning, I... Yes, on my rounds this morning, Don Sova's big face looked quite threatening. You made a disgraceful scene. What are you trying to do? Upset the patients? What are you putting into their heads? What was I trying to do? He spoke without heat, but emphatically, as Don Sova had. He set up, his back firm against the back of the chair. I simply wanted to remind you of my right to dispose of my own life. A man can dispose of his own life, can't he? You agree I have that right? Don Sova looked down at his colorless, winding scar and was silent. Kostogotov developed his point. You see, you start from a completely false position. No sooner does a patient come to you than you begin to do all his thinking for him. After that, the thinking's done by your standing orders, your five-minute conferences, your program, your plan, and the honor of your medical department. And, one again, I become a grain of sand, just as I was in the camp. Once again, nothing depends on me. The clinic obtains written consent from every patient before every operation, Don't Silva reminded him. Why had she mentioned an operation? He'd never let himself be operated on, not for anything. Thank you, thank you for that anyway. Even though it was only for its own protection, the clinic at least does that. Unless there's an operation, you simply don't ask the patient anything, and you never explain anything. But surely, x-rays have some effect, too. Where did you get all these rumors about x-rays? Don Silva made a guess. Was it from Rabinovich? I don't know any Rabinovich. Kostoglatov shook his head firmly. I'm talking about the principle of the thing. It was, in fact, from Rabinovich that he had heard these gloomy stories about the after-effects of x-rays, but he'd promised not to give him away. Rabinovich was an outpatient who had already had more than 200 sessions. He'd made very heavy weather of them, and with every dozen he'd felt closer to death than recovery. Where he lived, no one understood him, not a soul, in his apartment of his building or his block. They were healthy people who ran about from noon till night thinking of success or failures, things that seemed terribly important to them. Even his own family had gotten tired of him. It was only here, on the steps of the cancer clinic, that the patients listened to him for hours and sympathized. They understood what it means to be a man when a small triangular area grows bone hard and the irradiation scars lie thick on the skin where the x-rays have penetrated. Honestly, there he was talking about the principle of the thing. Wasn't that just what Don Sova and her assistants needed to spend the days talking to patients about the principles on which they were being treated? Where would they find the time for the treatment then? Every now and again, some stubborn, meticulous lover of knowledge, like this man, or Rabinovich, would crop up out of a batch of 50 patients and run into the ground, prizing explanations out of her about the course of his disease. When this happened, 
one couldn't avoid the hard task of offering the occasional explanation. And Kostogotov's case was a special one, even from the medical point of view, by virtue of the extraordinary negligence with which it had been handled. Up to the time of her arrival on the scene, when he had finally been allowed out to receive treatment, it was as if there had been a malicious conspiracy to drive him to the very borderline of death. His case was a special one, too, because of the exceptionally rapid revival which had begun under X-ray treatment. Kostoglatov, twelve sessions of X-rays have turned you from a corpse into a living human being. How dare you attack your treatment? You complain that they gave you no treatment in the camp or in exile, that they neglected you, and in the same breath, you grumble because people are treating you and taking trouble over you. Where's the logic in that? Obviously, there's no logic. Kostoglatov shook his shaggy black mane. But maybe there needn't be any, Ludmila Afonsievna. After all, man is a complicated being. Why should he be explainable by logic? Or, for that matter, by economics or physiology? Yes, I did come to you as a corpse, and I begged you to take me in. And I lay on the floor by the staircase, and therefore you make the logical deduction that I came to you to be saved at any price. But I don't want to be saved at any price. There isn't anything in the world for which I'd agree to pay any price. He began to speak more quickly. It was something he'd never liked doing, but Donsova was making an attempt to interrupt, and he still had a great deal more to say on the subject. I came to you to relieve my suffering. I said I'm in terrible pain. Help me. And you did. And now I'm not in pain. Thank you. Thank you. I'm grateful. And I'm in your debt. Only now, let me go. Just let me crawl away like a dog to my kennel, so I can lick my wounds and rest till I'm better. And when the disease catches up with you, you'll come crawling back to us? Perhaps. Perhaps I'll come crawling back to you, and we shall have to take you. Yes, and that's where I see your mercy. What are you worried about? Your recovery percentages? Your records? How you'll be able to explain letting me go after 15 sessions when the Academy of Medical Sciences recommends not less than 60? Never in life had she heard such incoherent rubbish. As a matter of fact, from the record's point of view, it would be to her advantage to discharge him and make a note of marked improvement. This never would apply after 50 sessions. But he kept hammering away at his point. As far as I'm concerned, it's enough that you've driven back the tumor and stopped it. It's on the defensive. I'm on the defensive, too. Fine. A soldier has a much better life in defense. And whatever happens, you'll never be able to cure me completely. There's no such thing as a complete cure in cancer. All processes of nature are characterized by the law of diminishing returns. They reach a point where big efforts yield small results. In the beginning, my tumor was breaking up quickly. Now it'll go slowly. So let me go with what's left of my blood. Where did you pick up all of this information? I'd like to know. Donsova frowned. Ever since I was a child, I've loved browsing through medical books. But what exactly are you afraid of in our treatment? Ludmila Afonsievna, I don't know what to be afraid of. I'm not a doctor. Perhaps you know... But you don't want to tell me. For example, Vera Kornilyevna wants to put me on a course of glucose injections. Absolutely essential. But I don't want it. Why on earth not? In the first place, it's unnatural. If I need grape sugar, give it to me through my mouth. Why this 20th century gimmick? Why should every medicine be given by injection? Don't you see anything similar in nature among animals, do you? In a hundred years' time, they'll laugh at us and call us savages. And then, the way they gave injections. One nurse gets it right the first time. Another punctures your, your ulnar reflection to bits. I don't want it. And now I see you're getting ready to give me blood transfusions. 
you ought to be delighted. Somebody's willing to give you their blood. That means health, life. But I don't want it. They gave a Chechen here a transfusion in front of me once. Afterwards, he was in convulsions on his bed for three hours. They said, incomplete compatibility. Then they gave someone else blood and missed the vein. A great lump came up on his arm. Now it's compresses and vapor baths for a whole month. I don't want it. But substantial x-ray treatment is impossible without transfusion. Then don't give it. Why do you assume you have the right to decide for someone else? Don't you agree? It's a terrifying right, one that rarely leads to good. You should be careful. No one's entitled to it. Oh, that was, uh, that was my Google Nest outside. It's listening to my voice. That's never happened before. But uh, that's interesting. I should, I guess, speak quieter. Being spied on. But doctors are entitled to that right. Doctors above all, exclaimed Onsova with deep conviction. By now she was really angry. Without that right, there'd be no such thing as medicine. And look what it leads to. You're going to deliver a lecture on radiation sickness soon, aren't you? How do you know that? Ludmila Afonsievna was quite astonished. Well, it wasn't very difficult, I assumed. It was quite simple. He had seen a thick folder of typescript lying on her table. Although the title was upside down, he had managed to read it during the conversation and had understood its meaning. Or rather, I guessed. There is a new name, radiation sickness, which means there must be lectures about it. But you see, twenty years ago, you irradiated some old Kostoglatov in spite of his protests that he was afraid of the treatment, and you reassured him that everything was all right, because you didn't know then that radiation sickness existed. It's the same with me today. I don't know yet what I'm supposed to be afraid of. I just want you to let me go. I want to recover under my own resources. Then maybe I'll just get better. Isn't that right? Doctors have one sacred principle. The patient must never be frightened. He must be encouraged, but with a patient as important. What? As importunate? But with a patient as importunate as Kostoglatov, exactly the reverse tactics were required. Shock. That's the most confusing sentence I've ever written. R Roten. Redden. Red. But with a patient as importunate, as importunate as Kostoglatov, exactly the reverse tactics were required. Shock. Better? No, you won't get better, let me assure you. Her four fingers slammed the table like a whisk swatting a fly. That you won't. You are going, she paused to measure the blow, to die. She looked at him to see him flinch. But he merely fell silent. You'll be exactly like Azovkin, and you've seen the condition he's in. Well, you've got the same disease as him, in an almost identical state of neglect. We're saving Amajan, because we began to give him radiotherapy immediately after his operation. But with you, we've lost two years. Can you imagine it? There should have been another operation straight away on the lymph node, next to the one they operated on. But they let it go, do you see? And the secondaries just flowed on. Your tumor is one of the most dangerous kinds of cancer. It is very rapid to develop and acutely malignant, which means secondaries appear very quickly too. Not long ago, its mortality rate was reckoned at 95%. Does that satisfy you? Look, I'll show you. She dragged a folder out of a pile and began to rummage through it. Kostolgatov was silent. Then he spoke up, but quietly, without any of the self-confidence he had shown a few minutes earlier. To be frank, I'm not much of a clinger to life. It's not only that there's none ahead of me, there's none behind me either. If I had a chance of six months of life, 
I want to live them to the full, but I can't make plans for ten or twenty years ahead. Extra treatment means extra torment. There'll be radiation sickness, vomiting. What's the point? Ah, yes, I found it. Here are our statistics. And she turned toward him, a double page taken from an exercise book. Right across the top of the sheet was written the name of his type of tumor. Then on the left side was a heading, already dead. And on the right side, still alive. There were three columns of names written in at different times, some in pencil, some in ink. On the left, there were no corrections, but on the right, crossings out. Crossings out, crossings out. This is what we do. When a patient's discharged, we write his name in the right-hand side, and then transfer him to the left one. Still, there are some lucky ones who have stayed in the right-hand one. Do you see? She gave him another moment to look at the list and to think about it. You think you're cured? She returned to the attack with vigor. You're as ill as you ever were. You're no different than when you were admitted. The only thing that's been made clear is that your tumor can be fought. That all is not lost yet. And this is the moment you choose to announce your leaving. All right, go. Get your discharge today. I'll arrange it for you now. And then I'll put your name down on the list. Still alive. He was silent. Come on, make up your mind. Ludmila Afonsievna, Kostolotov, was ready for a compromise. Look, if what's needed is a reasonable number of sessions, say five or ten, not five or ten, either no sessions at all or else as many as are necessary, that means from today, two sessions daily instead of one and all the requisite treatment and no smoking and one more essential condition, you must accept your treatment not just with faith, but with joy. That's the only way you'll ever recover. He lowered his head. Part of today's bargaining with the doctors had been in anticipation. He had been dreading that they were going to propose another operation, but they hadn't. X-ray treatment was tolerable. It wasn't too bad. Kostogotov had something in reserve, a secret medicine a mandrake root from Isik Kul. There was a motive behind his wish to go back to his place in the woodlands. He wanted to treat himself with the root. Because he had the root, he really only come to the cancer clinic to see what it was like. Dr. Donsova saw she had won the battle and could afford to be magnanimous. All right, then. I won't give you glucose. You can have another injection instead, an intramuscular one. Kostoglatov smiled. I see I'm going to have to give way. And please, see if you can hurry up the letter from Omsk. As he left the room, it seemed to him that he was walking between two eternities. On one side, a list of living, with its inevitable crossings out. On the other, eternal exile eternal as the stars, as the galaxies. That was the end of chapter six. That was a real tough one. Jeez.